CBS News. I'm Jay Jones. Five astronauts are strapped into the space shuttle Challenger right now at Cape Canaveral. It's about an hour and a half before liftoff for shuttle mission number seven under the command of Captain Robert Crippen with a crew of Hauk, Fabian, Ride, and Thagard. At last report, preparations were going smoothly for the beginning of the six-day mission. Among its firsts, a planned landing at the Kennedy Space Center the largest crew so far, five, and the first woman on an orbital flight, Sally Ride. Tens of thousands of spectators are lining the beaches and waterways near the space center. Some of them told us why they're there. You never really believe what you see on TV, so I, I just take this opportunity to come out here and see it for myself. I always wanted to see a launch of spacecraft ever since I was small. I see it on television, and that's nothing compared to feeling it. So that's why I want to be here. This is going to be the best. This is going to be the ultimate. There was another launch late yesterday in California, a successful test firing of the MX, the first for the experimental missile. It roared aloft from Vandenberg Air Force Base and hit a target area more than 4,000 miles away in the Pacific about a half hour later. Central Time, 6 o'clock. CBS News, this is Rob Armstrong. In just over a half hour, the U.S. Space Shuttle Challenger with its crew of five is scheduled to be blasted into orbit. CBS News correspondent Christopher Glenn is live on the line with me at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Chris, what's the latest? It's a very, very lovely day at uh, the Kennedy Space Center. A very uh, large cloud now sort of half blocking the sun so that uh, what they used to call in the movies glory rays are streaming down all around the uh, launch pad and uh, where the rocket stands getting ready for takeoff just about a half an hour from now. Looks very much like uh, everything is going to go on time at this point, Rob. It's been a very smooth countdown so far, has it not, Chris? As smooth as glass. Uh, there has not been a single glitch that I know of so far. Of course, in this last half hour, uh, things could go wrong and have gone wrong in the past, but it looks very much like they're getting better and better at it. It's a busy mission that's planned for the uh, Challenger. Busy indeed. Uh, they're going to be launching two satellites for uh, Canada and Indonesia, communication satellites, and they're going to be doing a very unique experiment where they will deploy a satellite into space, uh, free fly around it for a while, and then pick it back up with that long mechanical arm and put it back in the cargo bay, and that's a first for the flight. So the crew is all ready to go. Everybody is ready. I imagine that right at the moment they're lying there on their backs uh, looking up ahead uh, into the blue sky uh, through the windows of the spacecraft and just anxious for it to happen. Correspondent Christopher Glenn at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. We will have full live coverage of the launch of Challenger over most of these CBS radio network stations. More in a minute. Not yet? Okay. They're, 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 they're standing by over here, I think just about now. And uh, we're going to go down to Cape Canaveral, Cape Kennedy Air Force Base, and see what happens on the space shuttle. Shuttle 7, I'm Chris Glenn, CBS News at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Now all is ready for the familiar thrill of the launch. The five, Crippen, Hauk, Ride, Fabian, and Thaggard have been nestled in their places for more than two hours now, but their wait is almost over. The countdown, which has been textbook perfect so far, has less than five minutes to go. And we'll be back in one minute. If you're looking for a really good job, I have a word of advice for you. Look into the National Business Employment Weekly. Every week, the National Business Employment Weekly contains hundreds of job opportunities from every regional edition of the Wall Street Journal. And you know what that means. Top jobs in top companies at salaries from $25,000 a year up to $250,000. Top jobs. And every week, the National Business Employment Weekly gives you expert articles on how to write better resumes resumes, come across better in interviews, what the going salaries are, when to change jobs, when not to. Important, useful articles. If you want a really good job, the National Business Employment Weekly can help. Ask for the National Business Employment Weekly at your newsstand, or if you prefer, you can have the next eight issues sent by first class mail for $32. Call toll free in the continental U.S. 800-228-5500. That's 800-228-5500, except in Nebraska. Make your credit cards accepted. 
This is a one-week working mission for the shuttle, and the flight plan is crowded with activity. My colleague Judy Muller has a rundown for us. Chris, this is the largest crew to ever be launched in a single spaceship, and judging from the flight plan, it looks like they're going to be one of the busiest as well. The shuttle program was designed as a commercial venture, so the primary goal of this mission is to deliver two communications satellites into orbit for two paying customers, Canada and Indonesia. The first one, Canada's Annex C, is to be deployed some nine and a half hours from now. And one of the many first aboard this flight is a space platform, the West German Spas. It will give the crew a chance to practice with the shuttle's remote mechanical arm. The robot arm will place that $13 million platform outside the orbiter and will also retrieve it later. There are some 21 experiments on board, many focus on how to use the vacuum of space to manufacture materials and medicines, possibly with a purity not attainable in Earth's gravity. And Dr. Norman Thagard was added to the crew for just one purpose, to study that mysterious affliction known as space sickness, which affects about half of all astronauts. So all five crew members will have plenty to keep them busy, Chris, before they return here to the Cape next Friday morning. Okay, Judy, thank you. The vehicle assembly building here at the Kennedy Space Center is the tallest in Florida and an excellent place to eyeball the entire spaceport. Spencer Allen paid a visit up there. Sunrise came at 624 this morning, and by now the Cape area is bathed in early morning sunlight. There are some scattered clouds at 2,500 feet, with a high overcast at 18,000 feet, according to the latest Air Force weather briefings. Wind is out of the northeast at 7 knots, and visibility is 7 miles. So we are well within the weather parameters here for launch. Astronaut John Young has been making simulated approaches at the Kennedy Landing Strip in a jet trainer. His reported wind conditions and visibility are cranked into the computers right up to launch time. So from the top of the vehicle assembly building, all things appear to be go. Risk. All right, Spencer. Challenger will be landing on that runway that Spencer Allen described next Friday. It's the first time that the landing has taken place here in Florida. At least that is the plan at this point, but that familiar desert landing site at Edwards Air Base in California is available for contingencies and emergencies, and newsman John Goodman is there. Should an emergency landing be necessary this morning, the weather should be excellent. The nighttime sky is clear now. There are scattered clouds at 25,000 feet. Visibility at sunrise will be 7 miles. Winds across the Mojave Desert are out of the southwest at 10 to 15 knots. The temperature, 65 degrees. A mini convoy of NASA technicians has been standing by for over an hour for any possible landing here. If there is an abort once around, the Challenger would land during the gray dawn on concrete runway 22. After that, Challenger, Chris, would use dry lake bed runways 15 or 23. John. John Goodman at Edwards Air Base in California, and we're getting close to the launch here at the Kennedy Space Center for the flight of Shuttle 7. 20 seconds to go now. Controlling the final seconds. T minus 17 seconds and counting the body flap and speed breaker in launch position. T minus 10. And nine, now we see the first eight, indication seven, of flame from the bottom of the rocket. Go for main engine start. The main engines yeah, main are started. Start. And, and there is first motion of the rocket off, rapidly off, rising, rapidly rising, clearing the tower, and bright, a new sun going up into the sky, heading straight up into the air on a tongue of flame with a great mushroom billow of cloud beneath it. And now the rumble of the ignition and the explosion of the rockets shaking the building that we're in and Challenger climbs through a piece of cloud, slicing it neatly right through the middle, emerging from the top, streaking into the sky, higher than the sun, heading up into the blue and beyond it, into the blackness of space. Seconds. Challenger now, 2 and a half to local miles altitude. 45 seconds, Challenger now, 3 miles altitude. Cheers from the crowd assembled here at the press viewing site. Coming up now, straight up next as that stirring spectacle of the launch takes place once again. Heading now above our viewpoint almost. Looking good, still we're shaking from the thrust of those mighty engines. Now pitching down. Those mighty engines now 
racing along at about 90% of their uh, total thrust. Uh, Tower range, feet They're coming back now to begin throttling down and to uh, uh, get the ship pushed into orbit. Everything Mark, looking good at this point. Challenger now 16 nautical miles, now altitude 13 nautical miles down range. Grip and Halk and co Company now coming into the last traces of the Earth's atmosphere. Challenger now 19 nautical miles in altitude. 19 miles away, and we can see the uh, contrail still poking through the sky as it heads downrange out over the Atlantic, getting ready for the solid rocket boosters to fall away now. S SRB separation confirmed by the crew in the Challenger. And those two solid rocket boosters, reusable of course, they'll fall back into the ocean and be retrieved by pickup crews there to be used again on another flight. Your first stage performance was nominal. Everything looking good in first stage. Capcom Roy Bridges advising first stage performance. Onboard guidance is converging now as program. Challenger is now steering for a precise window in space for main engine shutdown. Two minutes, 40 seconds. Challenger 35 nautical miles in altitude. Standing by now for two engine towel capability. That means that they could get to the emergency landing site in Africa on two engines if need be. That indication should be coming. Two engine towel capability. Two engines take them to their first emergency landing site if needed in Africa. And of course at this point everything looking good and it doesn't look like they're going to need that. Mark, three minutes, ten seconds. Challenger's three main engines continue to run smoothly. Still Challenger's a big ride for them. really moving out now. Velocity now reading 7,200 feet per second. And there they go. 7,200 feet per second, building up, up, up through the thousands of feet per second until they seconds. reach that magic escape velocity and uh, remove themselves from the clutches of gravity. Mission control by Flight Director Jay Green. Three minutes, 35 seconds. Crew aboard Challenger given a go to continue. 3 minutes 40 seconds, Challenger 48 nautical miles in altitude, 105 nautical miles down the range. Now the ship has slipped Stand from our sight. Now for negative return call up by Capcom Roy Bridges. In a moment they won't be able. Negative return. Negative no coming return. back to the Kennedy Space Three Center at this point. 3 minutes 57 seconds with that call up, Crip and Halk ride, Fabian Fagard uh, committed to space travel. Roger that. So now, the least they could do is go into space briefly, and if there should be any trouble, which there looks like there is not, they would have to go once around the world and come back down in California. Mark, 4 minutes, 20 seconds. Challenger now, 54 nautical miles in altitude, 155 nautical miles down the range. Velocity now reading 9,500 feet per second. And they're looking good. Everything about this launch uh, uh, arrangement this time seems to have been picture perfect. There wasn't a single hitch in the entire procedure, uh, the last hours of it at any rate, and uh, everything has looked like the launch team and the entire shuttle operation are getting the hang of what they do so well that it is going to become what they hope it will become, the space trucking system taking commercial payloads into space and eventually they hope paying its own way. Challenger Houston, press to Miko. Press to Miko. That means they go now until main engine cutoff, which is coming up in about three minutes. At least they are going for that. Great grip. Her press to Miko call says should Challenger lose one engine, uh, press on, keep flying forward. Challenger's engines have enough energy to achieve normal altitude and velocity at cutoff. Five minutes, 30 seconds. Challenger 58 nautical miles in altitude, 260 nautical miles down range. Velocity now reading uh, 13,000 feet per second. So though the roar of the launch has long since uh, had its effect on us here at Cape Kennedy, they are still being pushed along mightily by those engines and will continue to be so for another two and a half minutes or so. This is, of course, the first flight of Dr. Sally Ride, a history-making morning uh, for, on that score. She is the first American woman to go into space.
One of her main duties on the flight will be to uh, operate the long mechanical arm and deploy a satellite pallet which will float free in space. The Challenger will fly around it doing experiments and they'll be taking pictures of each other. We may be able to get some pictures of the shuttle itself floating free in space, perhaps with the Earth behind it. So at this point, they're looking good. They're racing toward main engine cutoff, now less than two uh, minutes away. And uh, when they reach that point, they will uh, uh, be on their way into orbit. They still have to drop that uh, large external tank, which fuels those giant main engines. And they have the options at this point of, uh, uh, if there is an emergency, does not look like there will be, they can go once around the world and then come back to the Kennedy Space Center and land here on the concrete work runway they plan to use for the nominal landing next Friday. Crew reporting all systems are uh, looking good and they're feeling good. Challenger Houston, single engine press to Miko. Roger, single engine press. That is a good sign. That means they can now do it on one engine. They can get into orbit. Normal engine cut off targets even if two engines go out. Seven minutes, 30 seconds, G-Force is building uh, now for Crippen, Howick, Ride, Fabian, Sagard coming up to 3Gs, Challenger now 58 nautical miles in altitude, 570 nautical miles downrange, velocity now reading 22,000. Even though they're now feeling the pressure of three times the force of gravity, a flight aboard the shuttle is much less demanding as far as the G-Forces are concerned than the uh, old moon rockets, which are much larger and put quite a bit more stress on the human body. We're looking at the uh, pad. Now uh, the smoke is wisping away from the, from the base of the pad and its job is done until another flight. This past time, they turned the Challenger around and got it ready for another flight in 60 days. That's a new record. Eventually, they hope to uh, get that time pared down to two weeks or less so that they can fly perhaps as many as 25 or 30 shuttle flights per year. Roger, Miko. Okay, Eight main engines are shut seconds. down. Confirmed shutdown. Uh, Challenger has delivered to space the largest human payload in the history of mankind. Four men, one woman. And any Roger second seven. now. Yes, there it is. Separation. That giant main tank falling away into the ocean, wasted. Everything just fine aboard the flight of Shuttle 7 as the crew of five proceeds on into space. For my colleagues Judy Muller, I'm Chris Glenn, CBS News at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. CBS News, I'm Neil Strasser. The largest human payload of all time, as a NASA spokesman puts it, and the first American woman in space. A day of space history that began just about an hour and a half ago at Cape Canaveral, as the space shuttle Challenger took off with its payload of five astronauts, including Sally Ride. The latest from Christopher Glenn at the Cape. Orbit number two is well underway for the crew of Shuttle 7. Dr. Sally Ride, on her first trip into space as America's first woman in space, compared the thrill of the launch to a trip to Disneyland. Have you ever been to Disneyland? Affirmative. Definitely an e-ticket. An e-ticket at that amusement park, you see, gets you onto the very hottest rides. At the moment, the crew is busy with an important task, testing and then opening the giant payload bay doors, stretching most of the length of the spacecraft. Success in the maneuver is vital because the doors also serve as radiators, drawing off the heat of the space-naked sun from the ship and preventing temperature buildups inside. But so far, everything about the flight is letter-perfect, even though launch officials did apologize for being late with the liftoff, 59 milliseconds late. Christopher Glenn, CBS News, Kennedy Space Center, Florida. On the West Coast last evening, another launch which has Air Force officials using words like stupendous and magnificent. It was the first test flight of the big MX missile sent on a 4,700-mile path over the Pacific from Vandenberg Air Force Base to a point near Kwajalein Atoll, where it released six dummy warheads.
CBS News, this is Rob Armstrong. A picture-perfect launch for the Space Shuttle Challenger. Four men and this country's first woman astronaut were vaulted into space, and they've already begun work on their busy six-day mission. The latest now from Christopher Glenn. The crew of Shuttle 7 is on station in orbit, going about their tasks with very few hitches so far. They've had their Roman candle ride up from the launch pad. They've successfully opened the spacecraft's cargo bay doors, and they've gotten sunscreens into place to shield some of the experiment packages in the bay from the blazing rays. Later today, they'll be deploying a Canadian communication satellite they're carrying into its own orbit, and later in the flight, they'll perform the same service for an Indonesian satellite. Looks like deployment of satellites is going to become one of the bread and butter jobs of the space transportation system or as the astronauts call it the ace trucking company sally ride of course is now in the history books as america's first woman in space she likened the launch to having a ticket to the hottest rides in disneyland christopher glenn cbs news kennedy space center florida the shuttle will return to earth if everything continues as scheduled on friday for the first time returning to florida's kennedy space center five other shuttle missions have returned to edwards air force base in california one to white sands new mexico more news in a minute cbs news i'm neil strauser for the five astronauts aboard the shuttle challenger the first major work comes this afternoon when a communication satellite is to be injected into orbit but there are many preliminary tasks as judy muller tells us from cape canaveral the astronauts have a busy schedule this hour here's just some of what they're doing configuring the pressure control system doing a slew test of the ku band antenna that's used with the spas working with the monitor dispersed latex reactor initiating the inertial measurement unit, unstowing the cabin, calibrating the crew optical alignment site, maneuvering to negative Z local vertical nose forward attitude, and then they'll have lunch. Judy Muller, CBS News, Kennedy Space Center, Florida. Liftoff was perfect this morning at 7.33 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. More news in a moment. CBS News, this is Rob Armstrong. Aboard the Space Shuttle Challenger are getting ready for the first big task of their mission, the launch of a Canadian communications satellite. An Indonesian satellite will be launched later in the mission. Challenger was sent into orbit this morning after a picture-perfect launch. Mission Commander Bob Crippen is on his second shuttle flight. He told Mission Control that things are pretty routine. But Sally Ride, the nation's first woman in space, disagreed. Well, we're just trying to get the cabin all fixed up here. Nothing very exciting happening. He keeps saying there's nothing exciting happening. I'm not sure I'd go along with that. Roger that, Sally. We agree with you. We think it's very exciting. Challenger is scheduled to return to the Kennedy Space Center on Friday. CBS News. I'm Neil Strausser. And their work is finally receiving the recognition it deserves. I know I speak for all of us when I wish Dr. Ride and her fellow crew members the best of luck in their bold journey. Nancy and I look forward to being on hand to greet them when they land next Friday. The shuttle lands at Cape Canaveral next Friday, becoming the first to return to the takeoff point. The takeoff this morning was flawless. The five astronauts on board, a record human payload as NASA puts it, have been putting things in order and eating lunch. They came up on their first major project later this afternoon, putting a Canadian communication satellite in orbit. On this Earth, word of the discovery of another contamination problem. A spokesman for New Jersey Governor Thomas Kane says the dioxin has been found at a fragrance plant in Clifton, New Jersey. Making no secret of relation today. Shortly after the shuttle was launched this morning, Dr. Sally Ride told Mission Control it sure is fun. And she took issue with Commander Robert Crippen, who's on his second shuttle flight, said nothing exciting was happening. Said Dr. Ride, I'm not sure I would go along with that. But she also established her business-like approach when Mission Control turned off some cameras by remote control. Down came the somewhat irritated comment, maybe in the future, the controllers would let us know when they're going to do that. Back from Mission Control came a meet. Roger. Your stars are CBS News. And entertaining. This is WOAI, San Antonio's radio magazine. 
CBS News, this is Jackie Judd. Everything is going so well on board the shuttle Challenger that the flight director says there's virtually nothing to talk about. However, there is a complicated maneuver ahead, as Judy Muller reports from the Kennedy Space Center. One of the main chores in Challenger's six-day mission will come on this first day of flight. This afternoon, some nine and a half hours after launch, pilot Rick Houck will orient the shuttle to just the right direction, the precise points in time and space for the deployment of the first of two communication satellites aboard, Telesat Canada's Annex C-2. Astronaut Sally Rod and John Fabian will set the satellite spinning in the cargo bay, a kind of gyroscope action that stabilizes it for launch. Once Annex is ejected from the orbiter, NASA's job is over, its paid delivery to space complete. The astronauts will then change the shuttle's orbit slightly to put them a safe distance away before Annex rocket booster takes it to a higher orbit. Tomorrow, this same procedure will be repeated for Indonesia's Palapa satellite. Judy Muller, CBS News, at the Kennedy Space Center, Florida. The five astronauts are relaxed enough to kid around with mission control. At lunchtime, Sally Ride described the sandwich menu and radioed, you can say that the crew is three turkeys and two hams. Now this. If you carpool, you... The Space Shuttle Challenger with its five astronauts is duly orbiting the Earth, while its crew, including Sally Ride, the first U.S. woman in space, is hard at work. Flight Director Jay Green says all five are feeling well and having a ball. Their first job is to launch a satellite from the cargo bay, and that is supposed to happen in about an hour. Fortunately, we don't have communications with the Space Shuttle Challenger at this point. As a matter of fact, we won't have confirmation that this has actually happened for about another oh, 15 minutes or so. That's whenever they acquire a signal once again with the uh, Space Shuttle. We're coming up about uh, five seconds away from when that uh, satellite is supposed to deploy out of the rear of the uh, shuttle. And if all goes according to schedule, that satellite should now be gone out of the back of the Space Shuttle Challenger. The ejection to take place over the mid-Pacific Ocean. At this point, if all has gone according to schedule, NASA's job is over. The astronauts are going to perform a sort of an escape maneuver, which will change their orbit slightly and put a safe distance between Challenger and the Nix C uh, before its mated perigee kick motor. It's armed to fire automatically 45 minutes after, after ejection. Let's loose a plume of fire. Now that uh, burn, that Ohm's burn as they call it, the burn that will put the uh, Challenger out of range of the rocket of the, of the uh, satellite itself, we will be coming up at 4.17 this afternoon, about 15 minutes from now. And about 45 minutes from now, the PAN, as they call it, the payload assist module attached to that satellite will burn for 85 seconds, speed of 8,427 feet per second. And that will kick it into a very awkward egg-shaped orbit. You can't even compare it to an egg, as a matter of fact, in such a lopsided orbit. 160 miles by 19,823 miles. And later on down the road, of course, there will be more tweaks in that burn. Eventually, it will reach a perfectly geosynchronous orbit. Satellite's uh, perigee uh, kick motor is going to be fired off at 4.48 this afternoon to send it into that egg-shaped orbit. And uh, at around 7 o'clock tonight, uh, Telesat's tracking station is getting useful telemetry signals uh, containing vital data on the spacecraft health and status. They should be coming in about then. They may be getting weak signals out of the satellite as early as 10 minutes from now, but nothing useful will be coming in for another three hours or so. And uh, on Tuesday, this coming Tuesday, about this time on Tuesday, as a matter of fact, Telesat plans to fire a Nixie's Apogee motor on the uh, seventh orbital high point, the seventh Apogee, to circularize the satellite's orbit. Over the next three days, the Nick will drift toward its assigned geostationary parking orbit uh, over the uh, ocean. Uh, this period, uh, its lower solar panel is going to be deployed, the communications antenna raised up, and eventually, as a matter of fact, on Friday, it will arrive on station in its parking orbit, eventually to go into commercial service around Wednesday, the 20th of July. It's an interesting satellite they're launching up there, this $17 million satellite. It'll carry telephone signals, teleconferencing, uh, a few sporting events. But the most important facet of this satellite of all is it will or should be the first satellite to broadcast direct satellite-to-home
Home TV. That was okayed about 10 days just before the launch by the Federal Communications Commission of the United States government. Uh, eventually, the people who are deploying this whole thing hope that we will be able to buy small dishes to plant over our houses, about uh, two and a half to four feet in diameter, to pick up signals from this satellite. In other words, a sporting event, boxing tournaments, that sort of thing, will be beamed up to the satellite and bounced off of the satellite and down directly to our homes. The cost of the satellite dish, about $500, they estimate, and the subscription cost will be about $15 to $20 a month. Once again, that satellite should have been deployed at this point. We won't know for sure until about 10 minutes from now. That's when the uh, Challenger will come back into touch with the Earth, and that's when we'll know whether or not uh, everything has gone well aboard the Space Shuttle Challenger. Everything looked to be going well a few minutes ago when we saw our first pictures of America's first woman in space, Sally Ride, laughing and joking as she stood in front of a control console, looking out through a window at the Amix satellite spinning in the cargo bay. Once again, that satellite should have been deployed at this point. We'll be back with you later on on the hour with the first communications from the Space Shuttle Challenger to find out whether or not all went according to plans. Reporting live from the Johnson Space Center, Doug Miller, KTRH News. Things are going really well right now, at least we think so. We'll find out just a couple of minutes from now because, uh, well, in one minute and 30 seconds or so, we're going to reacquire uh, our signal. In other words, we're going to come back into contact with the Space Shuttle Challenger. Now, as you recall, just a few minutes ago at 4.02 this afternoon, the shuttle was scheduled to launch its first payload, its first satellite, that golden and Nick Canadian satellite to be launched out of there, eventually possibly beaming back pay sports, pay television, direct from satellite to Earth and into our homes, as a matter of fact. One day we may be able to get uh, satellite dishes to pick up the signals from this satellite if it got off on schedule. We don't know whether it did or not because it's been out of touch. We've been out of touch with the shuttle for the past couple of minutes. Uh, it's completely out of touch with us, as a matter of fact. We won't find out for another 55 or so seconds whether or not this thing got off the ground. If it didn't, it's going to represent a heck of a big investment, about $40 million that uh, the Canadian firm spent on this satellite. They've insured it for $65 billion with Lloyd's of London. And when I inquired about liability insurance, the insurance that's required just in case this thing comes crashing down to Earth like a Russian satellite once did, they said, don't even ask. So it looks like it's a heck of an investment for the Canadians, and it could have a heck of a payoff to people here in the United States if it does indeed start to be a record. Houston. Television playback underway of the uh, pre-deploy pass over in Hawaii with the uh, Hannock uh, spin table tooling along at about 50 revolutions per minute. They're playing back TV We're pictures on our monitors here. From looking at the picture that we saw a few minutes ago. Delay. At which time we should get a verbal report from the crew on the uh, deployment of the Hannock. eventually end up in a geosynchronous orbit and eventually it should be broadcasting the first direct satellite to home television broadcast into American homes. So that's the word. That's the uh, word on the first accomplishment of the shuttle Challenger reporting live from the Johnson Space Center. This is Doug Miller, KTRH News.
Roger, we'll look into that. News. I'm Stephanie Shelton. The five crew members of the space shuttle Challenger launched just this morning have gotten off to a flying start by successfully performing their first major task. Christopher Glenn reports from space headquarters. 
Matter-of-factly, Challenger's crew has accomplished one of the prime objectives of the mission, deployment of the Annex C-2 Canadian Communications Satellite. Commander Bob Crippen reported the achievement. Okay, uh, Houston, as previously advertised, we really do deliver. Annex uh, was deployed on time. Uh, Houston, uh, we have the orbiter 3 for 3 on PAM deployed. Dr. Sally Ride at the end there remarking on the PAM, or Payload Assist Module, which they use to drop off deployed satellites in space. PAM first gets the satellite spinning up to 50 times a minute, and then uses springs to pop it out of the cargo bay. Now Challenger has moved away from Annex somewhat, and Annex's own engine should have fired, starting it on its way to its ultimate Earth stationary orbit, 22,000 miles up. It was that maneuver, you may recall, which went awry during a satellite deployment on the last shuttle flight, but the success or failure of the Annex burn this time won't be known for some time yet. Christopher Gwen, CBS News, Space Headquarters, Florida. Important task in space. She and mission specialist uh, John Fabian watched on television monitors as the Golden and Nick satellite spun out of the space shuttle, shooting glints of sunlight back at the Challenger as it slowly, at just two and a half feet per second, rose out on its own. Okay, uh, Houston, as previously advertised, we really do deliver. Panic uh, was deployed on time. Uh, Houston, uh, we have the orbiter 3 for 15 minutes later, the satellite's booster fired it into a slightly different orbit, and about 20 minutes ago, that engine was supposed to have fired again. Telesat Canada won't know for another five or so minutes whether that engine firing has kicked its $17 million bird on target. If it flies right, it'll eventually broadcast television pictures direct to a few homes in the United States. An Indonesian satellite is next on the delivery order. That's set for tomorrow morning. Right now, the five astronauts that NASA's touting as the largest human cargo ever launched into space are preparing for sleep. Its first day's work flawlessly finished. Live at the Johnson Space Center, Doug Miller, KTRH News. Uh, where that 
CBS News. This is Jackie Judd. It has achieved one of its prime objectives. It successfully launched a Canadian communications satellite from the cargo bay, and then rocket boosters burned or began to push the satellite into orbit. A shuttle astronaut gave a thumbs up to mission control. Well, the Annex folks would like to uh, thank you for a beautiful launch, and we did have a good uh, PKM burn, and looks like it's on its way. Okay, that's good news. Another satellite, this one from Indonesia, is to be launched tomorrow. Canada paid $12 million to have its satellite launched by Challenger. The financial community is welcoming the reappointment of Paul... CBS News, this is Paul Lockwood. The Challenger Space Shuttle are now in their first sleep period in space and will be for about five hours more. Well, and this is the first day of the mission, starting with a letter-perfect liftoff from Cape Canaveral and including the launching of the first of two communication satellites to be sent into orbit on the flight. The second satellite will be released tomorrow morning. CBS News, this is Paul Lockwood. For the Challenger Space Shuttle, we'll be getting a wake-up call from Mission Control about an hour from now to begin their second day in outer space. Good morning, the launch of the second of two communication satellites. The first one went smoothly on Saturday. Later in the day, astronauts John Fabian and Sally Ride will be checking out the spacecraft's mechanical arm for about an hour's time.